want to introduce archaeological method to you a little bit and also its implications for reading the Old Testament. Um, for the last century, evangelicals have really relied on archaeology to try to bolster their uh, the claims of biblical truth. And we're going to talk some about that in our context of historiography, but I want to introduce some concepts to you, show you some photographs of some sites, and then again reflect on what archaeology can do, what it can't do, and what its uses can be to help us as we seek to read the Bible wisely and well. Here's a picture of a tell. Um, a tell is just a, a word that, that it's Arabic that uh, talks. That's essentially the site of an ancient city. If you notice here, um, this isn't a, this isn't a hill you're looking at. This is actually multiple levels of a site uh, that over centuries builds up. So in the ancient world, when a, a, a city was destroyed for whatever reason, you built the next city on top of it. So slowly over time, it would become elevated. And also, you can notice there on the front of this, on the front uh, right, you can see a trench which is dug in uh, for the um, to do the archaeological work. Here's another shot from the side of a tell. Again, this isn't a mountain. This is actually an occupational, um, an area that was occupied. And if you kind of cut through there, you can find the different levels of a site or the strata. And as archaeologists dig in, they look for the different strata uh, in order to um, understand what the different levels of habitation are, and then they would look, you look for pottery in different strata to see how it matches with other tells, and that allows archaeologists to, to establish essentially a relative chronology between the different sites that they're studying in, in one place. Here's Jericho, one of the most famous sites that have been dug up, um, and as you can see, they found the power wires there at Jericho, ha ha ha. But as you can see, in all seriousness, look, look how much excavation work has been done here. And that's one of the things, once you excavate a site, Careful records have to be made and maintained of everything it's, that's found. And in a sense, every uh, spade full of dirt goes through a sieve to make sure they don't miss anything. Because once you dig a site, you can't redig the same spot. You can always dig in a different place, but you can't redo an archaeological dig. You have to dig um, somewhere new. And so you can see our, Jericho has been thoroughly excavated. This is how an archaeological site is done. It's, it's laid out in grids, and you essentially begin to dig down, leaving the walls... And on the walls, if you look where the man is standing behind him, there's small pieces of paper. That marks the different strata that I was talking about so that you can establish your stratigraphy. And as you can see here, they've uncovered at this particular level that they're at, actually the remains of walls and um, of buildings that they're reconstructing. Here's a shot, shot showing the stratigraphy. And you can see that the tags marking the different places. And you can see that these aren't necessarily straight lines. Uh, because of earthquakes and just the way that ruins were done, these aren't necessarily straight levels. And as you can also see, it's not that easy to necessarily see the different uh, stratum that are there. Another picture of an archaeologist working, doing some measurements. Here's a picture of a volunteer, probably uh, not only getting a good suntan, but actually, as you can see, she is with a paintbrush carefully um, uncovering some little bits of pottery there. Again, everything is kept, everything is recorded, everything's documented. And I said volunteer. If those of you, if you're interested in this, you can actually volunteer, which means you actually pay. You you pay to go and actually work at an archaeological site. If you're near one of the campuses, check out Biblical Archaeology Review. They always have a list of open sites. And also check our score, course schedule. Sometimes Lost in Stone, sometimes um, one of our former Old Testament professors, Sandra Richter, takes a group to Israel to actually participate in a dig. So if that, you'd be interested in that, um, let me know and I can connect you with the right person. Here's a picture of, again, every piece of pottery is kept. It's cleaned up. It's, um, it's tagged. It's marked so it can then possibly later um, be reconstructed. And here's a, an example of a person who's, I guess, was when they were a child, they were really good at puzzles because now they're there working, re reconstructing, restoring a piece of pottery. And the pottery is really important because pottery is the key to actually dating when a level is. There's been enough pottery discovered in the ancient world that uh, actually a typology has been set up where, again, if you find you know, the right part of a piece of pottery, you can literally date something within 20 to 30 years based on what the pottery looks like, which is quite fascinating. Well, let's talk about some of the things that archaeology can and can't do because sometimes we think it's a magic bullet. But one of the key things you have to remember is that archaeology, just like the Bible, needs interpreted. It's not some, somehow a, a more true or objective science than, say, biblical studies is, because archaeology still needs an interpreter. 
Um, we can't ever get around that. Interpretation is involved everywhere. There, there's no such thing as just a brute fact, really. The archaeology itself needs to be studied, examined, understood, dated, correlated, all those different things. So that makes method very important. If you go Indiana Jones style into an archaeological site, you essentially ruin that for everybody else, and you, and you probably, for the sake of trying to get the great artifact, you destroy all kinds of smaller things that might have been really important for understanding a culture. So method is very important. In the previous slides, you saw the grid layout. That's done. That's done for both sites um, and underwater sites. Also, there's um, other kind of methods like surface survey when you quickly uh, walk an area to look and, and assess what's there. Uh, there's, just, there's lots of different uh, kinds of methods, but the, the, probably the, the most typical one is to lay things out in a grid and then carefully record everything that's discovered. And also remember there's an element of chance because one of the myths is you don't dig up every spot of a site. Archaeology is very expensive. So there's always an element of chance that the area that you selected to dig you may be, could literally be inches away from something really important and you don't find it simply because you didn't have the financing to, to do a complete dig of a site. So there's always an element of chance. Or you may just accidentally discover something like the Dead Sea Scrolls, discovered by chance. All right, um, what archaeology can't do? Now, it, it really can't prove or disprove claims of divine intervention. I mean, think about it. Um, you can even if you back up something that shows that in the, that's, that the Bible says happened, does that prove that God did it? You see what I mean? So, archaeology itself isn't going to be able to prove or disprove claims of divine intervention because what would that look like? Also, it's never going to replace the role of faith because again, even if you could prove that all the events in the Bible actually happened, does that necessarily prove that God exists, or does that prove that I have to make have a claim on that? Now, obviously, if we could prove conclusively that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, um, that would probably require some kind of a faith claim by everyone. But again, archaeology itself is not going to replace the role of faith. And, and like these other claims, archaeology alone isn't going to prove or disprove the authority or the inspiration of the Bible. Because even if the Bible was 100% true from a historical perspective, does that make it a divine book? Um, not necessarily. All right, well, what, what can it contribute then? And there's three things that archaeology can help us with. First, it helps us to set the biblical narrative into its historical context. Because it is true that the more that you know about the world that produced the Bible, the easier it is to actually understand the Bible. And if we could have all knowledge of that, it would make our lives a lot easier to understand things. So it, it is important. So when you're reading the scriptures, make sure you check out geographical references. Use a Bible dictionary. Look at where um, place names are made. Look at historical events. Because arche in archaeology is, is one of the means that helps us to reconstruct the past so we can understand the backdrop for the scriptures. It can also provide a check to purely literary approaches. I mean, that is, any approach to the Bible that thinks it can read and understand the scriptures um, alone without any recourse uh, to some kind of reconstruction or understanding of the past. So archaeology helps us to make sure that we're not misreading parts of the Bible. And last, um, archaeology can help us to just to simply, from a humanitarian and antiquarian perspective, help us to give us real insights into the daily lives of, of the people that live there. That can help us understand the text, but it also just helps us to understand humanity. And there's been so much archaeology done that you can even find out what condiments people used in the ancient world or what kind of foods they ate or what kind of things they made their clothing out of. All these kind of things have been studied. So that's a little introduction to archaeology. Hope it whets your appetite a bit. And we'll look forward to talking about all of um, this and more in our decompression chamber next week. Have a good rest of uh, your day.